Good evening, everybody. I mean, how many's glad to be in the Lord's house? Amen. Come here. He said, I want to go with you. I said, well, come on. Uh, just want to give a quick announcement real quick. Saturday at uh, 9 a.m., we're going to be doing a lot of weed eating, uh, some bush hogging, some stuff over here on this side, getting some land prepared and cleaning up some stuff that already is. So if you'd like to volunteer and help with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to open with a scripture tonight. The Lord placed on my heart. Psalms chapter number 100. It said, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gate with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Somebody shout, he is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures through all the generations. What a powerful scripture we find in Psalm chapter 100. The psalmist says, just enter into his gates with praise and with thanksgiving. And I don't know about you, but it's Wednesday. And if you're like me, we've been halfway through the work week. And sometimes we get tired and we get stressed out with life and, and the jobs and my oldest started school today, so I've been my, my stress meter's been about tapping out. Uh, but he done good, and I'm thankful for that. But, you know, life is hard sometimes if we're just being honest. Amen? Sometimes it's difficult. But what I love is the scripture when it says, Just enter into his, into his courts with praise and with thanksgiving into his gates and give him honor and glory and all praise. I was watching a video today, and I'm, I'm just about done, but... I was watching a video today and I, I seen a minister who was saying, we don't worship for God, we worship for ourselves." And I thought, how, how untrue is that? All my praise, all my worship goes to the one who created me, who shaped me, who formed me, who loved me at my lowest. Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost already. The one who, le I left him. I ran away from him many times, but he came after me. Amen. I'm thankful when I was in my sin, in my mess ups, that he still come after me. And tonight I've got one agenda on my mind. And that is to worship Jesus with everything that I possibly can. So while you stand to your feet this evening and we open in a word of prayer, would you take 10 seconds and give God the best shout of praise? Come on, somebody. Give Him praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. We pray. God, I know it's Wednesday, but you're still God. I know it's a midweek, but you're still good. Come on, clap your hands, all you people. Lift up your voice with a shout of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy tonight. God, we love you so much. Father, we love you and we honor you for this opportunity to come into your house one more time. God, to wor worship you and to lift up and magnify your beautiful name. God, I pray that right now that your at this atmosphere would be invaded by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would touch lives that haven't been touched in a while. God, I pray that you would mend broken hearts. And God, I pray that you would fix that mind that is wandering tonight. God, I pray that soul that's hanging in the balance would come to know you. God, I pray tonight for a manifestation of your glory, a manifestation of your presence. My God, I know that people are going through struggles right now. And God, I know that sometimes life can be overbearing. But God, you are the one that we love. You are the one that is able able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ever ask him or ever imagine. So God, one more time, everybody in this house, give him a big shout of praise and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me be in this house tonight. And Father, we'll never fail to honor you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's worship. Your strength Your grace poured out in my despair When I feel like a tired, burned out and defeated Your perfect love will find me there And you call Yeah. 
Great.
belong to Him tonight. Hallelujah. You never stop, you never 
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. A way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. glad he's a way maker tonight. Amen. If our ushers will go ahead and come forward at this time, we want to receive our offering. You know, a lot of times in life we go through things and we wonder why. You know, we pray and we pray and we pray. And we think, well, God, you know, why aren't you moving in this situation? But you know, God is moving even when we don't see it or when we don't feel it. You know, we don't have to see it or feel it. And that's why, you know, we walk by faith. And, uh, you know, sometimes, honestly, it seems like things have to hit rock bottom before, you know, God really begins to move in situations in our lives. Amen. But I'm so glad tonight that He is a way maker and that He makes a way for us. Aren't you? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that you are a way maker. Lord, that you are a promise keeper, Father. Lord, we just thank you for your presence tonight. Lord, we just pray tonight that above all things that you would be honored throughout this service, God. Lord, we pray that, Father, needs would be met, Lord. And God, we just pray that you would bless the preaching of your word this evening. And Father, we thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Over it. 
go to some place that is dead or a place I guess you're supposed to be quiet you know I understand there are places like that a wedding you know you don't get in a wedding ceremony and shout up all over the place or make all those noises at least most of them you don't uh, it's time to be quiet a time to observe what's going on but if I go to a ball game, I'm, I expect some action, don't you? I mean, I want to see some action, and I want to be, even though I'm not down there playing football, I want to be cheering them on. It's kind of like church service. I said, people come to church because they want something alive, right? I was thinking that why some people don't want to go to church sometimes is because, because it's dead. <laughs> Some places are just dead and dry, and people go when they do go out of obligation or simply out of respect. But when you have a place that's lively, you don't go out of obligation and respect. You go out of desire. I mean, I, I want to be in the Lord's house, and I'm so glad that God let us come here this Wednesday night. You know, a lot of churches do, and that's fine. They do Wednesday night, uh, uh, I guess it's prayer service or stuff. I don't, what do they ever call it prayer service for? I mean, I don't ever remember us literally having prayer service here. But why, why do they call it prayer service? They teach on lots of different things, and, and they pray five minutes, and they teach about a lot of other things. So it's really not prayer service. It, it's just some teaching. We've always just had church. I remember years and years ago, we went and visited this family, and this lady said, well, I might come on a Wednesday night, back when we was in St. Charles, back when I probably had first got saved. And, and I thought, oh, yeah. That's really good. If only she knew what she was about to get into. Because she thought we'd just come in, you know, and everything was really quiet and calm. And people just got up there and, you know, the preacher just talked real low. And, and the congregation just sat there and, like they're at a funeral or something. But, boy, little did she know when she got there. I think it might have been that night that she got saved or the next uh, Sunday service. Or, but uh, it was an encounter for I think church ought to be a place that we encounter God's presence. Don't you? I mean, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that we got to see each other, but uh, I'm here for the Lord. Uh, I'm here to do the Lord's business, by the way, but I'm here for the Lord. Turn to somebody and tell them it's good to be in the Lord's house. My goal today is some way, you know, we've been doing a series over the past little bit, and so my goal is, even though I'm going to be talking a lot about history and, and some things that have happened and some things that have come about and uh, why some of these things are unscriptural and why some things are scriptural but my goal is to try to at least keep your interest uh, in the service because I believe there's lots of things that we can learn and, and we can apply to our life while we're listening to I guess we would say some history of the church if you have your Bible with you turn with me to Revelation chapter did I get loud or was that just me Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to read our scripture beginning in verse 18. I thought about trying to fit in two churches in one service. And Brother Bobby, I come to the conclusion, and I hope this don't discourage you tonight. It'll probably take me 40 minutes to get through this first service. And I thought maybe y'all didn't want to sit here for an hour and 45 minutes listening to me preach about two churches. So I thought I better just stick with the one and stay focused. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against thee, or against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat 
things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan as they say I will put on you no other burden but hold fast what you have till I come and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him will I give power over the nations he shall rule them with a rod of iron they shall be dashed into to pieces like the potter's vessel as I also have received of my father and I will give him the morning star he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches we thank you, Father, for this opportunity and privilege to be here. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. God, I ask you through the power of your Holy Spirit to enable me to speak this word. May it be spoken in clarity. May our hearts, Lord, receive it. And may our minds be able to comprehend it. In Jesus' wonderful name, let all of God's people say amen and amen. You may be seated. As I said at the very beginning of this series, uh, we talked about actually... A few service, a few messages prior to starting uh, our services concerning the seven churches. This is the fourth church that we've actually talked about. Uh, at the very beginning of our our series, we talked about the seven churches representing seven ages of time, about 300 A.D. up until the rapture of the church. Each statement to each church was a prophecy of what the church would encounter during the coming years. We talked about Ephesus and how Ephesus was a church that lost its first love. Smyrna, the suffering church. And the church we spoke about last week was Pergamos, tolerance. The church that we'll be speaking about this evening is considered a compromising church. There's a difference between tolerance and compromising. You know, I remember, and I think you've heard me say this before, I was watching a show and this woman asked how uh, uh, this gentleman's mother was doing. He said, how's your mother doing? How's your mother? He said, tolerable. In other words, he said, I can tolerate her. But you know what it's like to tolerate things, but they kind of nag at you and bother you and, and just irritate you. But this church is considered a compromising church. This church age was about 600 A.D. up until about 1500. Uh, the message to this church begins with a reference to the vision we read about in John chapter 1, the vision of Christ Jesus. Notice in verse 19, it is the commendation that Jesus begins with, uh, which he did to every church. You know, he, it's kind of like one of those things that, you know, they start telling you how good things are and how good it's going and the good things that you've done and all of a sudden it's like you've heard the expression you get the rug pulled out from an under you and this is the way Jesus does it each one of these portions of scripture except for two churches and I said but could you imagine reading this letter opening up this letter and and then hearing these things Jesus is talking about you know what great things you've done etc and you begin to it, it, it would make you you know begin to feel boastful and and you know uh I guess a little bit arrogant, and then all of a sudden he pulls the rug out from under you. Let me read verse 18 and 19 again. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things, says, says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And again, back in John chapter 1, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, John referred to Jesus in this fashion. And his feet are like fine brass. And he says, I know your works, your charity, and service and faith, your patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. So let's get into the history of this message this evening. During this church age, uh, the scripture talks about, or history shows, that Rome had gained, uh, uh, I guess, prominence. And they began to produce a lot of false teachings and doctrines in the church. 
they had rejected that what Christ did on the cross was complete. They denied, in essence, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, we don't have to look very far into our modern day and at different religions and, and see that this is very, very, very prevalent today. A lot of people feel like, and, and religions feel like that something else has to be done. That Christ dying on the cross was not enough. So they have to add something to it. In other words, they mixed works with faith. During this time, and we talked about some of these things last week. We talked about uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, were mass and confession and the rosary and worship of Murray was introduced to uh, the church of the Lord. At this time, they introduced the kissing of the Pope's feet. About the 12th century this took place, according to history. Worshipping images and relics. This wasn't something that, that the church started off doing. This was something that a religion added to the, 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 the teaching of the word, the scriptures. Again, they didn't feel like it was enough, so they began to add things. As a matter of fact, this particular organization, if you were to go to the second commandment in their teaching, they removed that, you know, not to bow down before idol worshipers in the second commandment. And they added one commandment to the second one so that, and done away with the worshiping of images. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. And again, at this time, they initiated the kissing of the Pope's feet and worshiping images and relics. You've seen it on TV. You've seen where they bowed down before these statues and they worship these Listen, I'm telling you, friend, there's only one person that I'm going to bow down to, and his name is Jesus. And I'm going to kiss anybody's feet. It's going to be the feet of Jesus. I'm not bowing down, and please don't take this like it's going to sound. I'm not bowing down before some old dude and kissing his feet. Because the Scripture tells us that that's worshiping idols. There was the use of holy water that was initiated at this time. The prayer beads of the rosary. Rosaries is a set of prayers that they prayed. And, and each little knot on that rosary bead represented a prayer. Kind of keep them in line. Which again is totally against the scripture. Uh, again about worshiping idols. The canonization of saints or dead saints. In other words, they, they, it was an omission of the, the dead people into sainthood. You heard me say this and... Listen, if you are a blood-bought, born-again child of the living God, then you are a saint. You ain't perfect, but you are a saint. We don't have to wait till we lie dead and somebody decides to come on and ordain us to be a saint. Because if we've been born again, we are saints of the living God. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not, I don't have to bow down or sit there and worship some statue when I can worship the living God. Hey, are you, are you hear me? We don't have to look at, at a picture. We don't have to lick a crystal ball or rub some fat guy on the belly when we can worship the true and living God. Come on. Are you with me? I, I don't know if you've ever seen You ever seen these dead people in these glass, glass coffins? They got them. They look like leather. And people bow down and worship these images. And the scripture totally speaks against it. Celibacy. In other words, you know what it is. I don't have to go into detail. It was all introduced about this time period. Again, it was things that were added to the word of God because apparently the word of God was not good enough for them. Jesus says concerning the commendation to the church, I know your works. I know you're doing something. I know your charity. I know your service and your faith and your patience. And he said your faith or your works to be more than at the beginning. So these people were absolutely doing something right. You know, we get a mindset because we're doing something right 
that God is well pleased with us. People get a mindset because they're doing a lot of works. And work, don't, don't misunderstand me. We're thankful for what everybody's doing uh, around this world because the religions of the world probably do more to help charity than any, than any government would ever do. But that's not what it's about, my friend. Works will not get you into heaven. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Now, when we might get saved by faith and do works, but that's not what saves us. But the Lord commended these people because of the great work that they had done. You would have never dreamed in a million years. Especially when you get a word like that, that this church that he's talking about would have needed a revival, would you? You would have never thought, you would have thought what a great church this is. And that's the way we look because we're human. We look at what people are doing and we think they're successful and that they're great, that they don't need a revival. You would have said, again, what a church this is. But this church needed an awakening. Can I, and let, let me, I want to relate it to, we need an awakening in our modern day, the day that we're living in. We need to get our focus back on the Lord and not all the work that's going on. They were involved, this church was. Again, they were involved in work, love service and faith they gave an appearance of a thriving and exciting church but they weren't not at all come on you know i'm not one of those people and please don't somebody's probably gonna get mad at me when i say this i don't have to have plaques on the wall of everything that we've done i don't need nobody to give give us a plaque to hang on our wall and say, hey, we donated 20000 or 50000 or 10000 or, or how good the pastor's been or how many people. I don't need that. But I imagine that this church probably had all kinds of plaques hanging on the walls commending them for their generosity and their labor and supposed their love. And people like that. People like to be patted on the back. People like to be recognized. Churches like to be recognized and acknowledged that they're a great church. God knows who we are. Uh, come on, are you hearing me? Everybody, everybody was coming probably and bragging on these people. Building up their ego. That's not, a, that's not hard to do. When somebody starts patting you on the back and telling you how great you are. Let me tell you, you ain't half as great as you think you are. I'll never forget the story I heard years ago when, when, when the general overseer, why, I think his name might have been Bob White. He was general overseer of the church of God. Maybe it wasn't Bob, but his, his last name was White. And they'd done this service honoring him. And they was telling him about all the great accomplishment that the general overseer had accomplished. And how great a man he was. And you probably heard me tell this before. He gets in this car and his wife looks at him and says, Brother White, you know you're not half the man they say you are. Not half the man they say you are. But they were being bragged on and their ego was being built up. We got to be careful, church, when our ego gets built up. It's fine to recognize or tell somebody, hey, we appreciate what you're doing, but never lift up a person or a church above the Lord. <laughs> Nobody deserves our praise. Nobody deserves our worship. Nobody deserves our loyalty like the Lord deserves our loyalty. loyalty. Come on. But tell them how great they are. You're good. You're good. Rome, you're a good preacher, but you're not that great. Roy, you're a fine, I'm all right, but I'm not that good. Shade, you do a good job. Don't get a big fat head. Because pride goes before a fall. I never forget this one guy. He said, I want you to go listen to this preacher. He's the best I have ever heard. I went and listened to him. He was a good preacher, but he wasn't the best I ever heard. He was not nowhere near the best I've ever heard. But sometimes people get their ego so built up. And they think there's something that they're not. I hope I haven't embarrassed you. And I hope I haven't embarrassed Shade. But we got to be careful not to get our ego built up. I was reading an article just today. Just today. About a preacher who gets in the pulpit. He had pretty much humiliated his congregation. Told them they were poorer than dirt. He said, I'd asked for a watch last year, and you didn't buy me that watch. He said, in essence, he said, you could take your McDonald's money, is what he said, and your other money, and you could have bought me that watch. He had an ego problem. Come on. We need to be careful about our ego. And again, let, let me get back to my, my, my message 
about a church being built up to be to think that they are something that they're not. But then they get a letter. Paul Harvey used to say, and now for the rest of the story. You, you just read the beginning. If you ever read one of those letters and they talk, it sounds real good and then it gets in our butt. We are sorry to tell you, blah, this is what Jesus said. They get a letter and he says, and I'm going to read verse 18 again. And unto the angel of the church of the church, or excuse me, unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet are like fine brass. He's saying in essence, I know you work, but I also know that you are a compromising church. Eyes of fire, feet like brass. He says, these things says the Son of God. The Son of God. The statement, eyes of like fire. As I said earlier, are in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 14. They describe Jesus' ability to see through any facade. You can't hide anything from the all-seeing eyes of God. Not only does God see everything, He knows everything. He knows the very thoughts and intents of our heart. He sees through our, our lies, our makeup. Are you listening to, to what I'm telling you? This they, they, they speak of revealing. His eyes are revealing. You ever had somebody look straight through you? You ever had somebody look at you and you think, they know something about me? They know. You ever, you ever come in, you've done something, and, and your wife looks at you and she goes, she knows. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Reba? Your daughters would come in, home and, and you would look at them and they'd begin to tell them their self, right? Because they thought she knew everything and she didn't really know anything. But they would give themselves away. And, and that's the way a lot, of mother, a lot of mothers have that ability. When their child comes in and have done something wrong, the mother could see through their lying a lot easier than the dad could most of the time. And this is Jesus. Jesus could see through the lies. He knew that there was something going on. He saw through their good. He saw t to the sin that was beneath them. Yeah, they were doing good things, but there was sin, brothers and sisters, in the camp. Come on. You could do good and still have sin. And Jesus saw the sin that was in their life. He saw something more than their supposed identity. I remember... Years ago, there was an individual in church. I just, something about him, I just couldn't quite point out. I knew something wasn't right, but I just couldn't lay my finger on it. I couldn't figure it out at all. I mean, it, later on it came out, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Neither could pastor, jury put his finger. We knew something wasn't right. But Jesus knows, church. Jesus knows immediately what's going on. He tells him, I've got a few things against you. He said, it's not well. He said, quit believing what everybody's saying about you. Quit believing that you're this great church, this great people. Because you ain't what they say you are. Come on. Jesus was telling this church that there's a real problem. Brothers and sisters, I'm afraid that these are words that certainly are probably ringing true in our modern day. There are some real problems in the body of Christ. Are you? Come on. There are some real issues in the body of Christ. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus can identify. We think we get away with stuff. We think that God does. Isn't that so strange? How many of you believe that the Lord sees everything? How many of you ever done anything? How many of you ever done anything wrong? How many of you done anything wrong today? <laughs> have you ever tried to hide something from somebody? Sure you have. A buddy of mine went and bought a, 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 I think it was a motorcycle. He didn't tell his wife for like two or three days, maybe a week. He bought a gun and didn't tell her for a long time. Uh, uh, went and bought a tablet. I was with him when he bought this tablet. She said, how much that tablet cost? He said, it wasn't too bad. I think it was like 600 bucks. <laughs> She said, well, how much was it? He says, well, it wasn't much. He never would tell her how much that thing cost. He hid it from her. 
And we try to hide things from God. We do things, right? Am I the only guilty person here this evening? This is where I try to relate it to us. We do things, and if we didn't think we was hiding it from the Lord, we wouldn't even do it. So our mindset is that God isn't looking at me doing what I'm doing. When the truth is, God sees every bit of it. Come on, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? So as I said, I couldn't point out the problem with this guy. But Jesus doesn't have a problem at all identifying the issue. So the real problem with the church. What was the real problem with the church? The Lord speaks very specifically concerning the problem in Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Listen to what he says. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Listen to this word. Somebody said prophetess. I believe in prophets, prophetess. I believe that. But I want you to notice the phrase, the verse, who calls herself a prophetess. We think everybody gets up and runs their mouth and says, thus says the Lord is a prophet or a prophetess, which is far from the truth. I don't have to put a a title upon me. God has called me who I am. I don't have to identify myself as any particular prophet, a, a priest, or anything like that. But this woman called herself a prophetess. And, 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 and thank you, Lord. She was a false prophetess. Because she, she was teaching God's people to commit fornication. She was teaching them to, to offer things sacrificed to idols. So she was a false prophetess. And I'm going to tell you, that's, that again, we have to relate it to this day that we live in. Because we live in a world where we, where, where we get caught up in people that we have a high regard for, whether it be on TV or whether we know them personally, and they start spewing a bunch of garbage out of their mouth, and we think because we have put them on a pedestal that everything they say is a thus says the Lord when it's nothing but a false prophecy. Come on. Come on. But I've got a few things against you. unexpected word come from the Lord. But he was saying, in essence, this was a day of tolerance. My God. My, look around us, church. Look, I mean, seriously, look around. We tolerate everything. In the church, we tolerate garbage. We've got Christians that believe in it's believe it's all right to live in sexual immorality and they're going to heaven. We got people in the body of Christ that believe it's all right to have a homosexual relationship and you can still be a Christian. We have learned to tolerate it, church, when God does not tolerate it. Or come on. We've come to the place where we compromise our conviction. And the scripture plainly tells us, Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Come on. So, the trend of the day was to spotlight everything that this church was doing positive and to downplay the negative. As a matter of fact, don't even talk about the negative. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like negative stuff. I'm I'm just being, I like it, Scott, when people are saying good things. And then all of a sudden, somebody brings something up negative. And the fact of the matter is you have to deal with it if it's true. We cannot allow ourselves to be conformed to the ideals of this modern world that we live in. Come on. If the Bible tells us it's wrong and to avoid it, we better believe it's wrong and we better, better avoid it. You know, we, talk, we don't talk about this very often in this church at all. We don't, we don't talk about the fact that probably 50, 60 million babies alone have been slaughtered in America. We don't, we've learned to tolerate it and live with it. Come on. We, can, I, can I, Lord, can I? There is an all-out assault on our little children. 
I'm talking about little toddlers up. There's an all-out assault. The Catholic Church said once, if we can keep a child up until the age of 12, we have got them for a lifetime. We start pouring in them at a very young age, and if we keep them to the age of 12, we got them to a lifetime. That's what the government's trying to do. In our schools, they're trying to teach our kids about being transgenders, about being homosexuals. We don't hate anybody. We love everybody. We want to see them come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But what they're trying to do is to indoctrinate our children. They know, they know just like the church knew, that if they start teaching them at a young age, by the time they're 12, they'll never change. So they have become a tolerant church, a compromising church. I'm going to love people to the day I die. I don't care if a man, a homosexual comes and sits back there. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to look down upon them. I'm not going to preach something just because they're here. I'm going to preach what thus says the Lord. And God, through his amazing grace and the power of his Holy Ghost, can bring them to the altar of repentance. But we can't fall into the trap, church. And this is not what I expected to do today. But we like the positive. But we don't want to hear about the negative. But Jesus was telling them about the negative. Because brothers and sisters, the negative forfeited everything that was going on positive. Come on. Don't upset the apple cord by telling me something's wrong. Jesus says, again, here's the problem. It's that woman, Jezebel. Somebody say that woman, Jezebel. That woman, Jezebel. I may have used this illustration before. How many of you would go to a doctor and trust the doctor who would ignore that you had a, a, a lump or something or not on the inside, whether it be on your breast, on your lung, or somewhere else, while telling you that you look great, that you've got a nice face, nice ears, your blood pressure's good, everything looks good on the outward. Oh, thank you, doctor. No, I want to know about what's going on the inside. Don't you? How many of us would talk? We talk about, oh, you look good today, church. You look, oh, you dress so fine. Your hair looks so beautiful. But what's on the inside? It's the inside that makes all of the difference in the world. You wouldn't tell. Would you want to keep a doctor that even though you know you got a big lump on the inside and he keeps telling you or she keeps telling you, that you look good, your body looks good, your blood pressure's good, but don't tell you anything at all about that lump on the inside. You wouldn't tolerate that. And Jesus will not tolerate this garbage. Come on. I don't need to know about my better points. I want to know what's going on. I've got diverticulitis. I would have went to the doctor and said, your belly looks just fine. Well, what about the inside, man? That's what's hurting me. And that's what's hurting the church. But the Lord gets to the point. He's very specific. He has no problem telling us the truth. Come on. Paul to the Corinthians says, It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you. It is reported. How many of you believe God, how many of you believe sexual immorality is wrong? So, can, let, how many of you believe sex before marriage is wrong? The Christian, we are heathens, we're out in this world, we've done all, that ain't the only thing we've done wrong. We've done a lot of other things that are wrong. But there's a problem when we start believing it in the church. Are you with me? There's a problem, and Jesus says, deal with the problem. Or else. I'm gonna, you got any problems? You need to deal with them. Or else. So who is Jezebel? Now we're talking about, we know who Jezebel was in the Old Testament. Who was Jezebel here? Maybe the pastor's wife. Oh gosh. A prophetess. Maybe the worship leader. Maybe somebody that just come, started coming to church. You know, when people call people Jezebels, people, most people don't really 
know what a Jezebel is? They think it's a prostitute or something. It's not that. It's a person with a controlling spirit. That's what Jezebel is. A person with a controlling spirit. He said, because you suffered that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idol. So whoever she was, she was bringing corruption to the body of Christ. And she's compared to the Jezebel of the Old Testament in 1 Kings and in 2 Kings. She was a pagan queen. Somebody say a pagan queen. She married king, the king of Israel, Ahab. She was a woman of influence. Somebody say influence. A woman of compromise. Now, just so I don't get our women in an uproar here. You don't have to be a woman to have a Jezebel spirit. Somebody says, I got a problem with that woman preacher. I got more problem with men preachers than I do the woman preachers. I've been let down by more men preachers than I have women preachers. That's a fact. So it don't have to be a woman to have a Jezebel spirit. But in this particular case, he's speaking concerning a woman. She was a woman of compromise. Somebody say compromise. As she sit on her queenly throne, she manipulated and dominated and controlled her husband, Ahab. We call that in our modern day, henpecked. Right? How many of you men are henpecked? <laughs> oh, I didn't expect that. I had, I had two or three people raise their hand back there. I am a loving husband. And although she might think I am, I don't think I am one bit. But I try to, I try to get along. But this woman controlled, in essence, the very throne. Think about that. A woman with this type of influence controlled her husband's throne. She had people murdered. She had people offer sacrifices to false idols. She had people committing sexual immorality. Uh, come on. Worshiping false gods. It wasn't that she wanted to do away with the worship of Christ. She just wanted to make sure that the worship of Baal was included, had its proper place. Does that sound familiar to you? We don't want to do away, they say, with Christians. Sure, they'd like to wipe us out. We don't want to do it with Christianity. We just want to make sure that Buddha and, and Hare Krishna and, and, and Islam and all these other religions have the same the same the, the same recognition and place in society as you do. Everybody says, you know, we come to America to, to, for religious freedom. No, 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 no. I beg to differ with you. It was Christian. Christian to avoid Christian persecution. We didn't come here so that all other uh, religions could come in. This nation was born a Christian nation and we've blown it plumb out of proportion. So again, she didn't want to do away with the worship of the Lord. She just wanted Baal worship to be equal. She wanted to alter the worship of God. She felt like she could improve on the teaching of the word. Does that sound familiar? Another testament. Wow. Well, I declare. We believe the same thing that you do, but only we believe another testament. We believe that, 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 that Joseph Smith has ascended to the seat of the Holy Ghost. I guess I'm supposed to not name these people, am I? I, I received a, a package from the Mormon church. It said, thus, their prophet, mm -hmm, said, thus says the Lord, we are angry at you, America, because you could have took Osama bin Laden alive and you murdered him. Another article says that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church, has now ascended to the office of the Holy Ghost. Imagine that if you would. We want to add something to the word because it does not fit our ideal of perfection. It doesn't make us feel good. There was one, one group who wanted to, to start to, to create a Bible and it was called the, the Bible, the non-offensive Bible. So they didn't talk about adultery and fornication or murders or lying or stealing or cheating or any of these other things. Holiness. They want to take all that out because it offended people. 
And this is what they were doing in this day. They were wanting to add to make the or to improve if they could the word of God. But brothers and sisters, the word of God, if you look at the very back of the book, it says the end. Can I, so I said it said the end. As a matter of fact, it says any man that adds to this book will add the plagues of this book to their life. Any person that takes away from this book will have his name removed from the book of life. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? So we can't add and we can't take away from the word of God. This woman was dominating. She was a fierce woman. She was so fierce that Elijah the prophet, who had just defeated 450 prophets of Baal, ran from this woman. Imagine that. Ran from this woman. God help us. There is a spirit of Jezebel prominent in the body of Christ today. Come on. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you will. So through the controlling and the dominant spirit that this woman had, she led the people of God to harsh judgment. Oh, but, but I didn't mean... Listen. You know what the word says. I'm not... Res- yes, you are responsible. If you sit under false teaching, you're responsible. I, I, I said, if you're sitting under false teaching, and you know it, you are responsible. Two doctrines. I'm going to try to rush you. I told you you didn't want me to do two of these tonight. Two doctrines were published. Number one, we spoke about it a moment ago. Eating meats offered to idols. They thought that God understood... As long as, as long as they had to do it because of their job, but they knew it was offered to idols. But yet they still received it because, well, it's my job. You ever heard anybody say that? My job requires that of me. <laughs> I've got to lie. I've got to steal. I've got to cheat. They were offering, eating, again, food. The Bible says, again, if we... No, it's offered to idols. We should not eat that. If we don't know, we can't help that. Number two, committing fornication. Literally and spiritually. Fornication. Now, how does somebody like this get a hold in the church? I tell people, I said, number one, and I'm going to get ahead of myself. He's the Lord of this church. Number two, I'm the pastor of this church. God put me here, not me. God put me here. I'm not anybody's Lord. I'm a servant of the people of God. But the way the vision of this church works, God speaks to me. I speak to the congregation. The congregation lays hold of it, and we run with this vision. That's the way God works. The authority that God places in church, it goes from God to the pastor, and it goes down. And we obey what the Lord says. We're not here to be dictators, but we're here just to be uh, submissive to the divine will of Almighty God. I guess I'm going to say it like my buddy said it over in Kentucky. He had a little stick. He called it his prodding stick. And he pastored a church over there, over at Close Splint. Close Splint. And he had a stick about this long. Really, he literally had this. Because he knew that that part of Kentucky had a rough reputation. As a matter of fact, when he went to pastor the church, first time he ever saw the church, there was two women fighting, fist fighting in the church parking lot. He stopped there and he says, what's going on here? They said, ain't none your business. It ain't none your business. Just get on down the road. He said, I'm afraid it is. He said, you see, I'm the new pastor. They said, you must be Brother Chris. You're our new pastor. (laughs) That's a fact. But he had a little prodding stick, and he had a big club. He said, that prodding stick, he said, if somebody goes to sleep on me in the church, he said, I'm going to come and prod him, prod him, (laughs) wake him up. He was serious. He said, if somebody here comes comes in here and tries to run this church, he pulled out that big club. He said, I'm beating them out the door. Are you getting what I'm saying? Don't get no bright ideals. Because this is God's church. And we ain't putting up with no Jezebel spirit in God's church. Give him a hand clap of praise. So how does someone like this get such a hold on the church? Jesus said to the church of Thyra Tyre, you have allowed somebody, a person with the spirit of Jezebel to come into the church And to spread this type of propaganda. I started to say this bunch of junk. But you've you've got to put an end to it quick. If somebody comes to you and starts whispering, stuff in your ears, trying to cause trouble, send them packing. Tell them you don't want to hear this garbage. 
You remember Ephesus. Ephesus, the Bible says, left their first love. But the Bible also said they was very militant against false doctrines. But this woman, again, she had a spirit of Jezebel. It was a spirit of an occult. Are you hearing me? Bondage. Domination. And the Bible says the source of it is the way of Satan. Oh, God. I won't go there. I won't go there. Can I tell you the devil's like a spy? He operates from a position of espionage and manipulation. He's undercover. I'm not pointing this to anybody, by the way. But he works undercover. He's like a spy sent into the church to try to stir trouble, to cause issues in the church, especially when things are going well. Remember that there was things were going well. And so he tries to start trouble in the church. Don't allow yourself to be a tool of the devil. Don't allow yourself to spread gossip, to sow discord in the church, because if so, you have a spirit of Jezebel in you. Amen. Notice what Jesus says, though. Jesus said, I will not condone this type of stuff in my church. I will not tolerate controlling spirits and little cliques in my church. You know what I'm talking about, little cliques, don't you? I ain't talking about somebody you go out and eat dinner with. I'm just not talking about somebody you sit down and you spread rumors and gossip and, and try to figure out how you can gain control over certain areas. Are you, you understand what I'm talking about? So he said, I'm not tolerating Jezebelism in my church. Not only that, I'm not going to support those who allow it to happen. Come on. They allow, think about it. They allow this person to take over and to dominate. I remember somebody coming up to me. They said, so-and-so wants to know. I said, who? He said, well, I can't tell you. I said, I can't answer them. So help me. I said, I can't answer. Because I don't know who's asking. They could say, we want to know about the tithes of the church. I'm not telling them if they don't, if they don't, if they don't support the church financially. I figure it's none of their business. Right? If it's got something to do with, with the church that we're what we're doing and they're never here, I ain't telling them. I don't figure if they tell me who it is, then I can discern whether or not they have a right to know. Come on, give give it my hand clap of praise. We gotta be careful not to let stuff get out of hand, church. Now, I'm getting ready to close, by the way. Somebody say praise the Lord. I want you to understand something about the family of God. The family of God, as the family of God, we should never manipulate and play petty games. Because in the church, everybody is the same. It just so happened that God placed me up here as pastor. And only he knows why. But everybody is the same in the church. Come on. And so we can't play petty little games. Scott, this is my motto in life. Or I guess I don't know if it's a motto, what you would call it. When somebody does something to me or says that I let it roll off my back like water off of a duck's back. I try my best not to get offended at all these little things. Some people get offended at nothing. Oh, they didn't ask me nothing. Nothing. And they get all stirred up, troubled and aggravated and they start gossiping and telling lies. Come on. Petty little games. We're too close to the finish line to play petty little games stand with me if you would I told you this some time ago I remember when I was a young Christian and I would sit there with the accountants and all these people and I my, it seemed to me like my intellectual level compared to theirs I was on a 1 they was on a 10 but I had something on the inside of me and I would share the gospel with them and they would sit and listen to me for hours when I tell them about Jesus and one lady told me, she said, Roy, you wouldn't want to come to our church. She said, there were some visitors at our church, and the pastor asked them to take up an offering. And there was a couple of, just so happened to be a couple of ladies there that said, there is no way in H-E-L-L -L 
they'll ever be a part of this church controlling spirits troublemakers hindrances to the kingdom come on hindrances to the harvest Christianity is not about social power we got a pastor's council we've had it ever since only God knows how long there's five guys on our pastor's council we meet on a monthly basis unless we you know happen to put it off for another month and we discuss the issues of this church we discuss the, we go over every financial report every single month down to the last penny we know exactly where it went and if you if you're if you're a giver in this church if you're a faithful tithe in this church you can you have the right to look at that at any time if you would like people get in some of these in some of these places and they try to gain some kind of control one organization it's the deacons that does the firing and the hiring in other words, if they don't like what I preach, Joe, they could, I could be out next week. I know there's been times I've preached stuff that you, you fellas and you folks just don't like. But you won't have the authority to boot me out or not one pastor's council has that. That'll come from the state office in Roanoke, Virginia. But nobody has, which is the way it's supposed to be. God places the shepherd. This is not about social power, who can gain control in this church. It's about lordship. It is about the lordship of Jesus Christ and us submitting ourselves to the lordship of Jesus. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? So, again, they had allowed. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? I, I, I can't say this enough. And just, just so you feel it, we're all on level playing ground. We're, we're, every single one of us are, are the same. There's no big eyes. And, is that the way they say it? And little yous or what, little eyes, we're all the same. In God's eyes, that's who we are. But the Bible tells us that we are fitly joined together to form the body with every joint rightly supplying that which is needful. And when you've got a part of the body that's playing, have you, ever, have you ever had a part of your body playing games with the rest of your body? In other words, how many of you had your knee just didn't do what it's supposed to do? Right? How many of you had your elbow or your shoulder didn't do what it's supposed to be? It didn't work good, did it? So we're all on the same playing field. And every person has a part in the kingdom of God. Again, I'm going to say that it is not about social power. It is about the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that was the problem that Jesus had with the church. It was about social power, about a woman named Jezebel, or a Jezebel spirit, trying to control God's church and add to the teaching of God's word and seduce God's people with some false doctrine. And the Lord says, I give her space to repent. In other words, God said, my mercy and my grace was extended. If you want to know why God hasn't brought judgment, God's grace and God's mercy. He has given the church or those that are in false teachings time to repent in this world also. Come on. So I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. And the Bible says she did not repent and she will be judged. But he says to those that are not guilty, hold fast. Hold on. Because I'm going to come through. And I'm about to bring this thing to an end. Hold fast. The heat's on, church. The pressure's on. The pressure's on our young people. It's on us. Come on. I told somebody this, listen, just so you know where I stand, for the 50,000th time, I have no hatred toward anybody whatsoever. God will judge me if I'm lying. I don't hate a person because of their sexual preference or their personal identity. I don't hate them at all. I love them with a godly love. But I love them enough to tell them the truth. Because it's truth that sets people free. And we don't have to compromise the truth of God's divine word. So to those of us, he says, hold fast. In other words, he says, don't follow the path of this woman with the Jezebel spirit. Don't allow it to happen. Put an end to it. Repent. Somebody tell me what the last part is. Or what? Else. And the else is literally... Or my judgment's going to come. I, help me, Lord. 
Lift up your hands all over this place. Oh, God. all the way, helping us through all of the difficulties of our life. When the enemy rises up against us and tries to tear us down and tries to instill lies in our hearts, if we'll stand strong upon the truth of God's divine word, God will raise us up like a beacon and help us to shine bright in this day that we live in. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will not, you know there's no song, I will not, I shall not be moved. Though Satan opposes me, I shall not be moved. Though the enemy comes against me, and though the enemy tries to control and dominate and manipulate me, I will not buckle under. I made up my mind to stand up on the truth of God's divine word no matter what comes my way. If hell itself should rise against us, we'll stand up on the word of the living God. If the enemy would try to seduce us, We'll stay pure and clean in the spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I, there are probably those that are tired of hearing me talk about some of these things. But we have got to ex ex expound upon the truth of God's word. The enemy puts it in our ear day after day after day after day. He continues to pound these lies day after day after day. Continue try to put to, to, for them to have influence in our mind and in our lives so it's important that we continually day by day by day by day expound on the word of the living God and what God's word says I'm not afraid I'm not, a be, I'm not afraid to be numbered with Christ I'm not afraid to be numbered with the blood bought church of the living God I'm not just associated with it. I'm part of it. I'm part of the blood bought, born again, the victorious church of the risen King. How about you? How about you? How many of you ready? How many of you say, I will not compromise. I will not buckle. I'll love with a godly love, but I will not buckle under the pressure of the adversary. Thank you, Father. I want you to pray. When I say this, I don't mean this in a physical way. But I want you to pray a violent prayer. The Bible says ever since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. What's he saying? It means we get, we get down to business in our prayer. We pray vicious, violent prayers. I don't mean for somebody to die, but where we get in touch with God, where we lay our hold on the horns of the altar and press through. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand for the Lord. For the Lord stood for me. Hallelujah. Can, can I get some warriors? Can I get some people that feel like they've got a spirit of a warrior? A spiritual warrior to step out of their seat and come stand around this altar. Make a difference. Make a difference. And Tell the Lord, tell the devil, I'm not going to, to buckle. Tell God you've decided to stand. Fear won't dominate me. Discouragement won't overcome me. Frustration won't dictate my life. But I surrender to the sovereign Lord of creation. Hallelujah. 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 Would you just lift up your voices? Hallelujah. I say hallelujah, 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 bless his name, hallelujah, 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 halleluj
Almighty God, everlasting Father, we submit ourselves to your divine authority. We humble ourselves under your grace, oh God. warned us that there would come a day when the time that we lived in would be a dangerous time and it said that there would be those that would come up against us to try to shake us from the foundation of God's truth but if we'll stand strong if we'll stand firm in the faith we will not be removed he said those things that can be shaken will be shaken those things that cannot will not be shaken that's where we stand 